Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus yet again today. I am Trace, and this is episode three of three on extinction. Somber topic, but I think we've had fun with it so far, just talking about all of the different ways that species can go extinct, and when conservation started, that was a big upper. There's a lot of wins there, so make sure you go back and listen to those two episodes. But today we're gonna talk about what species we can bring back from extinction and how that would work. So when it comes to things like dinosaurs, obviously we want to bring them back. We want a de-extinction event with dinosaurs, but that's not actually possible. I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It's the DNA. According to researchers, the half-life of DNA is 6.8 million years, and once it loses so many of those little genetic code letters, after about a million and a half years, it's not readable anymore. And this is, of course, under ideal preservation conditions which they're not gonna have laboratory conditions for when a dinosaur extinction happened 65 million years ago. So let's just stop talking about dinosaurs. There's no reason to ever do that. You can, of course, de-evolve a chicken into a dinosaur, which you can learn about in our series on dinosaurs. It's pretty cool. But what about animals that haven't been extinct for 65 or more million years? What about recently extinct animals? Can we bring those back? There have been numerous gene editing techniques that have come about over the last half century. We now know how to clone animals. We can understand this whole process. But right now, the most fascinating thing that might change this whole de-extinction system is CRISPR. CRISPR is a gene editing tool. It's actually called CRISPR-Cas9. It uses proteins to cut a bit of DNA, stick a new bit of DNA in there, and then the DNA heals itself back up again, and you've just replaced a gene. Now, if you could do this in a genetic level for a new species, you could just edit a current species, a cousin. It stands out from other techniques because it's so, so precise, and it's so efficient. And it actually happens naturally. In the 1980s, scientists were noticing a weird pattern in some bacterial genomes, and they realized there were these little palindromes, or uh, palindromic repeats, that's what CRISPR stands for, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. And it uses a Cas9 protein, or CRISPR-associated protein. And what happens is, those little repeated things are part of the bacterial immune system. And CRISPR is a collection of DNA sequences that tells the Cas9 enzyme what they need to cut based on the chunks of DNA trapped between those repeated palindromic sequences. So all you have to do is tell CRISPR-Cas9, this is the sequence to cut, and it goes and does it and can be done with any organism. It's really crazy. And today, the day that we're filming this right now, the United Kingdom approved using CRISPR on human embryos. Now, they cannot be implanted, but you can edit them in the United Kingdom, and that is, I mean, the ethical implications are staggering. And it changes so much when it comes to the topic for today. I know this was sort of a sidebar, but CRISPR is just so, so cool. But it changes everything, and the reason it does so is because it can directly affect conservation efforts. For example, the woolly mammoth died out 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age, right? That's what everybody says, woolly mammoths, dead. However, a particularly hardy colony of woolly mammoths managed to survive until about 4,000 years ago on what is today Russia's Wrangel Island north of Siberia in the Arctic Ocean. They did eventually go extinct, but we want them back, right? In early 2015, Harvard geneticist George Church and his colleagues were able to use CRISPR to insert mammoth genes, the genes of this fairly recently extinct mammoth, into the DNA of elephant skin cells. And these were genes that regulated things like ears, subcutaneous fat amounts, hair length and color, and even the hormone that regulates how the body uses blood sugar for energy, because the mammoth had different size years, more hair, more fat, because it was a cold weather animal. The mammoth DNA was extracted from the hair of two mammoths that they found in Siberia several years ago. One mammoth only died 20,000 years ago, the other died 60,000 years ago, and their DNA was okay. And this is just the first step. They need to make sure that the hybrid cells that they created 
could be used to make specialized tissues, things that make the mammoth produce the right amount of hair and the right texture and the color. And then they would grow those hybrid cells in either an artificial womb or they would try and implant it into an elephant. And then they would make sure that they can survive while they added more DNA and more DNA until they get a full implantable embryo. Woolly mammoths would be really incredible to bring back, although there are arguments both ways, right? If we brought back a mammoth, where would we put it? In a zoo? That doesn't sound like a very exciting existence for that animal. And since we're really doing this for the animal, right, not for us, that's the ethical question. Where would we put them? Where would their habitat be? And would we be then making laws saying we can't go in that area anymore because that's mammoth, that's mammoth town? There are other animals that we've been trying to bring back. The passenger pigeon, the world's last passenger pigeon died in 1914. Its name was Martha, it was in a zoo. Researchers extracted about one billion DNA letters, little coded letters from Martha, with the intent to put the passenger pigeon DNA into the genome of a cousin, the rock pigeon. The cells containing the passenger pigeon DNA could then be transformed into cells that produce eggs and sperm, which could be injected into rock pigeon eggs, producing a new passenger pigeon based on Martha. However, again, think back now into uh, our last episode with you need to have genetic diversity within your species. We only have one passenger pigeon still at that point. So we'd need to figure out what to do and how to create more passenger pigeons. The thing is, because of CRISPR, which has only been around for a short period of time, we're already making headway into bringing back or de-extincting these species. But again, the biggest issue here is ethics. Does being able to bring them back hinder conservation efforts for other species? Are we just crowding up the earth with things that went extinct? Some of them naturally, and some of them because we maybe feel some kind of human guilt for, dis for extincting them in the first place. Some would argue it does hinder our ability to conserve current species. Conservation ecologist at Duke University, Stuart Pym, believes that this ability might encourage support for the destruction of natural habitats because we could just bring back these extinct things later. That's kind of a good point. And if you can bring a species back, why do you need to save it? You can just de-extinct it any time you want. But ecologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Stanley Temple, says we can use some of these techniques to help endangered species. We can keep them from going extinct in the first place, improving their long-term viability. And of course, all of this, just because, just because we can bring something back, doesn't mean that we should, to paraphrase Dr. Ian Malcolm. Technology and science always brings with it some pretty heavy ethical questions, right? Like, if we could de-extinct any animal that went extinct in the last 100,000 years, which ones do we de-extinct? Do we de-extinct the ones that are the MOA from New Zealand, the ones that are the beginning of a domino effect, the ones that maybe we feel bad about, like the passenger pigeon that used to be, you know, dark in the skies of America, according to some writings from the time, and now they're gone, that we feel bad for? Or should we de-extinct species that are important for diversity? Should we de-extinct the rhino? Why? Who decides? Who decides what we de-extinct? I don't know and probably neither do you, because the problem is once something goes extinct, the world sort of just moves on, no matter how it went extinct. Sure, it can cause other things to go extinct, and those things can cause other things to go extinct, but eventually, once the land is clear, something else will move into it, and then they'll have their own species, and speciation will continue, and that's sort of how extinction events work. If you remember from earlier, 85% of all species went extinct like a bunch of times, but we still have millions of species because that's kind of how planet Earth works. So the question is, just because we can bring them back, should we? Why don't you tell us what you think down in the comments? Thanks for watching Test Tube Plus this week. Make sure you keep watching every week by subscribing right here on YouTube. You can also find us over on Twitter at Test Tube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez if you want to talk more about any of the topics you see here on Test Tube Plus or suggest new topics. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.